What's up, Guru Nation? Let's demystify clinical research. Guru Nation, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment, share. Really means a lot to me. Look, we're going back to the basics with this stuff. Like, I've been trying to redo a lot of the older videos, and this is one on investigator site files. And we actually use Creo, which is an e-reg. By the way, shout out to our sponsor, Creo. Shout out to our two other sponsors, um, Inato for your biz dev needs. It's free. And Versatrial for your organizational needs. It's free. But it, uh, this video, Creo is really taking like forefront because I'm literally on Creo right now looking at my electronic investigator site file. But whether your site uses paper or electronic, it doesn't even matter. Okay. What matters is these are the regulatory documents that are going to be at every research site in their investigative site file. This also means these are the same documents, minus a few, that are going to be in all trial master file systems at the CRO and sponsor level. So I'm just going to go through an order. I picked a study at random from Creo that we already, this is a real study that we were working on. We had a closeout visit recently. And I'm just going to show you the, go through and show you the investigator site file or the regulatory binder, as they're often called. So, and then I'm at the end, I'm going to kind of, or maybe I'll interweave it in the middle, whatever seems natural. Uh, when these documents are generated, when they're, when they're used, when they're maintained. So some of these are going to be in the startup period. Others are going to be right before initiation. Others are going to be throughout the course of the study for maintenance. But at the end of the trial, all these things get populated in the investigator site file, whether it's electronic, like in Creo, or on paper, like a good old fashioned regulatory binder, three, three ring uh, binders, doesn't matter. They're all the same. And now the order changes from study to study. There is no consistency. There is no standard. This is just how it goes. So the first, in this particular study, there are 23 sections. So the first section is contact list. So it shows you who is the contact for your site. So I'm looking at mine. It shows me the program manager at the sponsor level. It shows me the clinical study associate. It shows me a medical monitor, shows me the backup medical monitor, shows me the safety manager, shows me the drug safety surveillance associate, shows me who's in charge of study drugs, study budget at the CRO and sponsor level. All these people are at the sponsor and CRO level. It gives me as well all the CRAs, not just my CRA, all the CRAs working on the trial. And it gives me their emails, the state that they're located in, and their phone numbers. So I can contact whoever I want from the study. If I can't get a hold of someone, I could probably find their backup or a colleague or somebody in a similar role to them so that I can reach out to them. That's uh, section 1.1. In section 1.2, it's the site contact list. So in this particular case, we have who are the users for the IRT? And then it lists all of our coordinators and whoever has access to the IRT, including the PI in this case. Another form is the shipping list. Who at the site is responsible for receiving shipments, whether it's lab kits or investigational product or study supplies. Then it's a master site contact list. Who at the site uh, is doing what? What is their role? So here we have our PI. We have myself. I'm the lead study coordinator. We have our sub by. We have another sub by. We have a backup coordinator, a backup, a backup, a backup. We also have a pharmacist, a, a regulatory contact, a study nurse, contract and budget. Who is the contact person for all these functions? And what do they do and who can get a hold of them? I'm, I presume the sponsors and CROs like to have this. And then you're not really supposed to throw anything away when you generate a form in research. So you put it in your, in our case, we put it in our investigative site file, which is electronic in Creo. So that's easy. The next is the contracts and insurance. So this is the study contract. We do not keep it in here. You don't have to keep your contract and budget as a site in your investigator site file. 
what we have is a note to file stating where the contract and budget is kept. The reason we don't keep it in there is because anything that's in the investigator site file is open to an audit by a regulatory agency. So I've just been taught from day one, which was 2005 in this industry, don't put your contracts and budgets in there. You're just giving the FDA or whomever is going to audit you potentially another document to look at. You don't need to give them more things to look at. You want to give them less things to look at. Next, in section three for this study, again, remember the order doesn't matter, but the contents of what is in this investigator site file is applicable for most studies. In this study, section three is protocol and amendments. So obviously the protocol, super important, as well as all versions of the protocol. Then you have the protocol signature page. So for all versions of the protocol, you also have a protocol signature page. So they need to, they being the sponsor, need to ascertain that the PI understands that they are liable for the conduct of the study at their site and that they receive the protocol, but it would be cumbersome to email 300 pages. Most protocols are between 150 to 300 pages every time there's an amendment and have the PI sign and then email this big document. So what they do is they have protocol signature pages for every version of the protocol. So that's filed as well. Then you have memos. In this case, memos is protocol clarification letter. In this example, we have from the sponsor a protocol clarification letter. We actually have three of them. This one says, hey, this is about the electronic patient reported outcome. Uh, it, it was unclear from the protocol, maybe, uh, the specifics of how this should be measured. So we're, we're making it clear here from in week 14, you got to do this. At week two, you got to do this. I'm not going to get into the study details, but sometimes protocols require protocol clarifications, and that's where those go. Um, investigator brochure is next. Remember, everything that's known about this drug, about the study drug, since they've been studying it, so from animal models to first in human to whatever phase you're currently on, all known information about the investigator brochure goes in the investigator brochure. So all known information that is known about the investigational product goes in the investigator's brochure. These are also ginormous pages. Here we have um, three different versions, no, four different versions. And just like the protocol, it has a investigator brochure acknowledgement of receipt. In this case, they're called investigator brochure acceptance version. So these things can get pretty lengthy as well. Uh, in this particular case, the investigator brochure was 180 pages. So if you ever wanted to get deep into the science of your investigational product, have at it with the investigator brochure. It gets into everything from the introduction, the dosage forms, the routes, the storage and handling, which will tell you about the temperature excursions. It will tell you about non-clinical studies in vitro, in vivo, human ex vivo studies. Uh, it's going to get into the toxicology, the effects in humans. It's going to get into different studies that they've done across a wide variety of indications. Any indications that this investigational product was used, it's done. It's, these are lengthy things. So again, just like the protocol, this is, there's a, one signature page on it for the PI, only for the PI. PI Science Protocol uh, signature page and the Investigator Brochure Acknowledgement page. Those are the only two uh, pages that only the PI signs, right? And then you have all versions of it, just like you did with the protocol. And then you have all versions, the accompanying acceptance form, signature page, whatever it may be. Section five is IRB approved consent documents. So this is the informed consent. And again, all versions of it. So in this case, we have uh, one version only, one in English and one in Spanish. So our site requested uh, Spanish informed consents and we were given it. And in this case, we only had one version of it and they're both filed in there uh, with, and these are the IRB approved informed consent. 
Then you have in this particular study, section six, IRB approvals and correspondence. So any IRB approval. So here we have the initial IRB submission for the site, which is the net startup. I'm going to do another video in length on study startup. Maybe in, in the future, I've done some in the past, so go check it out. And at the end of this video, I'm going to give some context. I think the end would make the most, the most sense. I'm going to give some context as to when these documents are generated and um, at which stage of the trial, whether it's startup, activation, maintenance, or closeout. So you've got all the IRB submissions. In this case, we've got the rating scales that are being used. We've got the electronic patient reported outcome tools like screenshots of everything that's been approved by the IRB. We have the IRB roster. We're using a central IRB, so their current roster. We have the IRB submission notification. We have another rating scale, another rating scale. We have a uh, certificate of action for the subjects when they get trained on doing a certain diary. Uh, translation certificate for the Spanish questionnaires for the patients. Because remember, we asked for Spanish ICF, informed consent. Well, for the electronic patient reported outcomes, it would make sense to have those in Spanish as well. And those also have to be IRB approved in Spanish. So translation certificate. IRB correspondence also goes there. So this is the initial review notice. I'll get into a little bit of that at the end as well as all the um, study expiration dates, study renewals, uh, important information about your e-submissions, et cetera, just filing things, continuing review reports. Every year, the site has to renew their IRB uh, application so that the IRB has to approve the, the study site every year that the, site, that the trial is ongoing until closeout. Uh, Section four, still under the IRB section, we have all the flyers, all the recruitment material that the sponsor and CRO created that are IRB approved. They're in there as well. Section seven, 1572, arguably the most important form in all of research. And again, I lied when I said the PIs, only the PI signs protocol signature page and investigator brochure signature page uh, and no other staff member. Also, only the PI and no other staff member signs the FDA 1572 form. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that at the end, but that's in Section 7 and also all versions of it. So when we add a sub-investigator or when we change a lab or whatever the site makes changes on that 1572 form, really the 1572 deserves its own video. Those have to get changed. And so in our case, we only had one version of it because we don't have that many sub-investigators. We only had two. Uh, section 8 is investigator qualification documents. So this section is PICV and medical license. And remember, those medical licenses expire sometimes every year, every two years. You got to put all of those in there. Sub-investigator CV and medical license, and then other staff CVs and licenses. So coordinators, study nurse, whoever's working on the study, whoever's working on the delegation of authorities log, which we're going to actually get into in a few sections from now. Section nine in this study is the financial disclosure forms. So signed for all investigators listed in box six on the 1572. Here we had one, two, three people on there, the PI and the two sub eyes. Section 10 is the lab. So anything to do with labs. In this study, we use the central lab, but that comes with a central lab manual. Uh, if the coordinator ever has issues or questions about how the labs need to be processed or shipped or prepared or drawn or how to reorder more lab kits, it's all in the lab manual. We also have the central lab certificate. So just because you're using a central lab or a local lab, they still have to have their own certificates. You can pull those up or request them from the lab if it's a central lab or even a local lab and put them in there. Then we have the, some, some, some manuals for some specialty labs 
that this study had some specialty labs, so they had a separate manual for those. Uh, you, you'll see those sometimes with PK studies too. Um, the next section was local lab certifications and then local lab normal ranges. So what are the reference ranges, the normal reference ranges? This gets important as there's multiple sites on studies, obviously, and not all sites use a central lab. So for local labs, um, sometimes the reference ranges for a local lab at one site might be different than the reference ranges for another site using a central lab. Uh, section 10.5, we're still under the lab section 10. Section 10.5 is the local lab director CV or the central lab director CV. Section 11 in this case is the pharmacy manual. So in the pharmacy manual, we had the pharmacy manual. Now this is a little bit different than the investigator brochure. This is actually uh, a pharmacy manual which has different information about the safety profile, the formulation, the study blinding, how to keep staff blinded and unblinded. This was a, a blinded study. So it has information about keeping staff blinded. Then we had a dose calculation. So this was also an infusion. So it's not just enough in the investigator brochure. This is the specifics about how to prepare the dose, how to monitor the temperature. Uh, they give you actual blank temperature logs and then they give you a temperature excursion log should you ever have an excursion. Then in section 11.4, which we're still on the pharmacy section, which is also investigational product, we have the investigational product log. So anytime a subject is dosed, this is the master investigational product accountability log. But you also log these in at the individual subject levels, which will go into the subject source, which we're not talking about today. We're just talking about investigator site files and regulatory. Well, master investigational products go in regulatory usually, and then subject level investigational products go in the subject source. Also in this section is kits, how to reorder more investigational product, and then the last section in the investigational product section is the IP shipment receipts and note to files or anything like that. Section 12 is all about the IRT system. So IRT is the uh, interactive response technology system. These are like the new IWRS that are out now uh, where they kind of try to integrate EDC and um IP accountability and registering subjects. So it has the entire manual for how to use the IRT. And then it has a user log. So who's going to have access to the IRT and then a data change form, which not every study has this, but this one did. And it's, Hey, if let's say a subject, uh, or maybe a staff member made a data entry error in the IRT, you can't change those like you do in the EDC or in a source because it's a closed system. So you have to fill out this form. It's called a data change form or a DCF where you could write your error and what it should be changed to. And you use these occasionally on things, like I said, unlike EDC and source where you can make changes due to um, a data entry error, for example. Uh, in the IRT, you can't. So you have to request that the system be changed. Section 13 is training. So this is good clinical practice training for all study staff. Uh, and then any other study related training, like in this case, very important site training log. And we're going to get into that. I'm just going to breeze through the rest of these sections really quick. Section 14, the delegation of authorities log. Uh, in this case, it's called a delegation of responsibility log. Same thing. This lists every staff member, including the PI, what they're going to be doing as delegated by the PI and only the PI. And then the PI initials and dates next to every single staff member that he or she delegates this person to do this. Now, when it gets into monitoring, we talked about monitoring before. Go watch some of the other videos. There's a lot of things that trigger uh 
the DOA log versus the training logs and new staff members. And that this is where monitoring gets complex, but I'm trying to keep this simple just to focus on what are these documents. Section 15 is the screening and enrollment log. So anytime you screen a patient, anytime you randomize a patient, you put them on this log. Section 16 is the protocol deviation log. Anytime there is a deviation in the study, you put it in this log. And then there's an IRB. There's a special form for this study for IRB to report patient safety protocol deviations to the IRB. Uh, speaking of safety, section 17 is serious adverse events. So you have the SAE forms, the templates, the SAE log is in here. Uh, you also have SAE reports if your site had any. Um, section 17.3, which is still under SAEs, is for pregnancy reporting. Section 18, IND. So investigational new drug. These are the IND safety reports. So these are SUSARs, basically. So anytime there is an SAE Let's go through what SUSAR means really quick. Suspected, unexpected, serious adverse reaction. Anytime there is an SAE at any site in the study using this same investigational product that is suspected to be related to that IP and unexpected, meaning it's new information that was not in the investigator brochure that I mentioned earlier, that meets SUSAR criteria. So not all SAEs are SUSARs, but all SUSARs are SAEs. These forms go out to all the sites participating in the study and they let them know, hey, at this site, they experienced the SUSAR, so just be on the lookout in case you see something similar at your site. Section 19 is the clinical site monitoring visits. So you got monitoring visit logs that the monitor needs to fill out every time they come in and initial all the uh, confirmation letters for the all the monitoring visits, including the site selection visit, the site initiation visit, the interim monitoring visit, and the closeout visit. You've got the confirmation letters and the follow-up letters for all those respective monitoring visits. You also have a section where you could file any other monitoring correspondence. Then you have section 20. In this case, it's sponsor correspondence. So in this case, all the newsletters they send. Sometimes sponsors send monthly newsletters, sometimes quarterly. And then in another section here, it's other sponsor correspondence. So whenever the site is interacting with the sponsor through written communication, it gets documented in this section. Then you have, in this study, they were nice enough to provide us source templates, which was really nice. So in this section, they don't usually do that. In this section, we actually had the source templates for this study that the sponsor made for us. So we filed them here. And then we converted them to Creo. We converted them to electronic source. But it was nice to have the templates there. Uh, section 22 is the CRF, so case report forms. So again, everything's digital now. So case report forms are EDC, electronic data capture. That's all a EDC is is an electronic CRF, an electronic case report form. So those those acronyms are interchangeable. CRF, EDC, ECRF. Those are all interchangeable. We have the EDC manual. We have the ECRF completion guidelines. And then we have screenshots of the blank ECRFs. Usually they send you those so you can create your own source. Um, but they don't always do that. Uh, and then finally, section 23, the last section is miscellaneous. So we have what we've been using miscellaneous for is anything that doesn't fit nicely in one of these other aforementioned sections. For example, we have our calibration log in there for our equipment calibration. Um, we have random things like how to delete something in one of these ePros, um, how to reset a form just random stuff goes in there, just like the name miscellaneous says. So now let's go back really quick and, and go through study startup, site activation, or ISF maintenance for some of these documents. So protocol and amendments is study startup. As soon as you get the study site selection visit letter, even before you get selected for the study, you should have signed a CDA confidentiality disclosure agreement and you should have gotten that protocol so that's the first time you get the protocol that should be filed and then the protocol signature page that should be filed then any other amendments 
you get them from there. Investigator brochure, same thing, right before site activation. So SIV, site initiation visit, is the activation for the site. You'll get the investigator brochure. IRB approval should come for the site. The site-specific IRB approval should come before site initiation visit. So that's another study startup activity. 1572, it's another study startup activity. Once you've been selected, they give you a 1572, you fill it out, then you fill out the financial disclosure forms for all the sub-investigators listed in box six um, of that 1572, and then you provide the CVs and medical licenses of PIs, sub-I's, and all the coordinators. That's also during study startup. Uh, central lab manual, you should get it prior to site activation. Pharmacy manual, again, prior to site activation. IRT, EDC, training and access prior to site activation, which anytime you hear me say site activation, it's site initiation visit. Um, GCP training should be done at study startup prior to activation. You should receive the actual investigator site file like the physical uh, book, the binder, prior to site activation. And it's your choice if you use something like Creo for EREG to just put everything in Creo. And then you can still keep the physical binder. Our site does it. I know some sites that just get rid of it and just use Creo for the EREG. And you're, the FDA says you're allowed to do that. So once you e-sign something, a digital document, it becomes the original. Uh, screening and enrollment log, that comes pre-site activation, the delegation of authorities log, you fill it out at SIV. The, usually the CRA is there to do it with you. They can't write on it, but they can guide you how to fill it out. You could fill it out before site initiation visit too, but most sites wait till site initiation visit itself to actually do it. Then protocol screening and enrollment log comes after site activation you'll have the actual templates for all this stuff but there's no need to fill it out until you start screening someone same thing with protocol deviation you'll have the log in your isf investigator site file but there's no need to fill it out until you actually have a deviation same thing with saes you will have the logs you'll have the forms no need to do anything with it until you have a sae those are obviously after site activation Clinical site monitoring visits, you should start keeping your letters from site selection visit going forward. And sponsor correspondence, same thing. ECRF completion guidelines, same thing. So IRB reports, again, you have the initial IRB startup. That's literally in the name during startup phase of the study. Then you should have by site activation or by site initiation visit, you should have the IRB approval for the site. You should also have the IRB approval for the informed consents. Uh, and then during the study, you have the continuing review report. So that's known as study maintenance or investigator site file maintenance of these documents. And then at closeout visit, you have, you guessed it, the IRB closeout form. And then end dates on all the delegation logs. But we're going to get into those and the other videos just wanted to keep this nice and sweet and short for you guys hopefully it helps demystify some of the elements of an investigator site file also known as a regulatory binder whether it's a physical binder or whether it's on something electronic like creo in my case thanks for watching hopefully it helps like subscribe comment share bye bye